Many would argue that there's no worse type of person than those who corrupt the lives of the young. This episode will do nothing to disprove that argument. A daughter gone missing for years remained just beneath her family's feet. Elizabeth Fritzel was born in 1966 and was raised alongside her six siblings with her parents in Amstetten, Austria. Considering herself the unlucky daughter in the family, her father, Joseph, began to sexually abuse Elizabeth when she was just 11 years old. Unable to tolerate her father's abuse, Elizabeth fled to the Austrian capital, Vienna, where she attempted to go into hiding with a friend in 1983. It took police weeks to locate the teenager, and once found, Elizabeth was promptly taken back to her hometown. It was August 29th, 1984, when Elizabeth's father lured her into the family basement. He asked the 18-year-old if she could assist him in bringing a large door down to the basement. Elizabeth complied and helped him bring down and hold up the door while he began fitting it into the frame of the basement entrance. Moments after the job was done, Joseph placed an ether-soaked towel over Elizabeth's face, knocking her unconscious. To everyone else, Elizabeth had vanished, and this caused Elizabeth's mother to fear for her daughter well-being. After a month into Elizabeth's disappearance, her mother filed a missing persons report to Austrian police. In order to further conceal Elizabeth's whereabouts, Joseph forced Elizabeth to write a fake letter to police stating that she had grown tired of living at home and had made her own decision to live with a good friend. If anyone dared search for her, she threatened to leave the country. This letter was given to law enforcement, which terminated the search. Joseph assured police and the family that his daughter most likely left to join a religious cult. Though it sounded out of the ordinary, police believed the theory and stopped questioning the disappearance. Over the next 24 years, Joseph would keep his daughter hidden in a windowless basement that came with a bed, refrigerator, wash basin, and toilet. Joseph would discreetly visit Elizabeth in her cellar every three days in order to provide his daughter with food and additional supplies. While she was held against her will, Joseph repeatedly raped Elizabeth, using his daughter as his own personal sex slave. The sexual abuse at the hands of her father eventually resulted in the birth of seven children. All children managed to survive except one newborn that died of complications three days after birth. Joseph took the deceased infant and incinerated the body on the family property. Three of the children were taken from Elizabeth as newborns, only to be raised by Joseph and Elizabeth's mother. The remaining three children, Felix, Kirsten, and Stefan, were kept in the basement cellar with Elizabeth, not to see the light of day for years to come. Social workers had been informed that each of the three infant grandchildren had been left on the family doorstep, allowing Joseph and his wife to become official foster parents of Elizabeth's children. Elizabeth and her children would eventually be discovered in 2008 after their eldest daughter, Kirsten, became extremely ill, falling unconscious in the cellar. With no choice but to seek medical attention, Kirsten was taken by ambulance to a nearby hospital, where doctors pronounced that the girl had serious life-threatening kidney failure. Unable to find any medical files on Kirsten, doctors questioned Joseph. With a puzzling story given to medical officials, police were alerted on April 21st. A public broadcast asking Kirsten's mother to come forward for questioning surfaced media outlets around the city. During this time, officers reopened Elizabeth's 1984 missing persons case and investigated further into the known whereabouts of the now 42-year-old woman. Elizabeth begged her father to take her to the hospital, and on April 26th, Joseph finally freed Elizabeth and her children after being kept in the dark cellar for nearly two and a half decades. The two children finally got to witness the outside world and were taken upstairs to the family home where Joseph escorted his daughter to the hospital. Elizabeth and her father were detained shortly after their entrance into the hospital, and after hours of exposing her long-awaited story to police, Joseph Fritzel was arrested under the suspicion of false 
imprisonment, rape, manslaughter by negligence, and incest. Joseph was able to confess everything two days later on April 28th, and after further DNA testing was done on the children, it was confirmed that all six living children belonged to Joseph and his daughter Elizabeth. After 24 years, Elizabeth was finally able to reunite with her siblings and mother. It was later reported that the family had no idea of the extreme torture that Elizabeth endured. The four-day trial against Joseph commenced on March 16, 2009. Joseph Fritzl was found guilty and charged with incest, enslavement, rape, coercion, false imprisonment, and the negligent homicide of a newborn baby boy. Joseph was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 15 years. Joseph continues to serve his time in prison. He is placed in a special prison for the criminally insane. It is such a shame that not even schools are safe anymore. Tanya Koch was a 13-year-old student at Cornell Middle School when she befriended Thomas Hose, a 37-year-old man that worked as a security guard at her school. Tanya began taking a liking to Thomas after he would take her out of classes to be with him. In February of 1996, Thomas convinced Tanya to run away from her family in order to live with him. Tanya obliged to Thomas's idea and left without informing her parents of her whereabouts. It didn't take long for Tanya to see Thomas's true intentions after she was forbidden from leaving his home that he shared with his parents and son. In order to keep Tanya a secret from the rest of the family, Thomas confined Tanya in his bedroom where she was forced to use a bucket as a toilet and could not shower. Thomas soon realized that he would be unable to hide her from his parents for long and instead introduced her to the family as his girlfriend named Nikki Allen. Not knowing the circumstances of her captivity, the family accepted Tanya, allowing her to occasionally leave the house under a strict curfew. On March 21st, 2006, Tanya reached out to grocery store owner Joe Sparico in hopes of escaping the house. After confessing her true identity, Joe was instructed to call police that same evening, resulting in Pennsylvania police formally arresting Thomas. In 2011, Thomas pled guilty to statutory rape and is serving a 5 to 15 year sentence. Though he is currently doing in jail time, Thomas was not charged with false imprisonment or kidnapping. Katie Beers was only two days away from celebrating her 10th birthday when she was kidnapped in 1992. Everything changed for Katie and her family on December 28th of that year when she was taken by a family friend named John Esposito. Katie had been playing at Spaceplex, an indoor amusement park, when she was approached by John. Since he was a recognizable face to her, Katie began to converse with the so-called family friend. John was able to persuade Katie into following him after promising her an abundance of birthday gifts waiting for her back at his home. Unaware of his true intentions, Katie agreed to leave with John, however, However, instead of being welcomed with gifts, John forced the nine-year-old into a six-foot by seven-foot concrete bunker under his garage. John claimed to have purposely built the bunker for Katie, placing chains to restrain her, a small mattress, a television set, and toilet to accommodate the child. John was arrested on January 13, 1933, after leading police to the hidden bunker. Officers found Katie alive and alone in the space. When questioned, Katie told police that John had raped her during her captivity. John denied the rape accusations and was not charged for it, but was still sentenced to 15 years to life on January 17, 1994, and served his sentence at Sing Sing Prison in New York. Due to the abuse she had endured by her mother before her captivity, Katie was sent to live with foster parents for the remainder of her childhood, living a happier life and eventually having her own family. In January 2013, Katie published a memoir titled Buried Memories talking about her horrific experience with John Esposito. John eventually admitted to the sexual abuse he inflicted on Katie, and on September 4th, 2013, shortly after his admission, officers found John dead in his cell from apparent natural causes. With such terrible people in the world, the wrong places and the wrong times are encountered much more frequently. 
It was a typical Sunday afternoon on October 6, 2002 when Sean Hornbeck, an 11-year-old from Richwoods, Missouri, rode his bike down a gravel road to visit a friend. Just as he continued pedaling, a white pickup truck came from behind and struck his back tire, causing him to fall into a ditch on the side of the road. In only moments, an unknown man ran out from the van and began picking Sean up, tying his hands behind his back and placing him inside of the pickup. As soon as he was placed inside, Sean had noticed a gun right beside his kid kidnapper's front seat. The man's first words to Sean were, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It would be four and a half years until friends and family would ever get to see his face again. Officers in the community searched vigorously for the 11-year-old, but little did they know that the missing boy was being held captive in an apartment just an hour away by Michael John Delvin, a kidnapper from Cameron, Missouri. Sean endured fearful days of physical and sexual abuse at the hands of his kidnapper and truly believed that he would see his loved ones ever again. The torment continued and only became worse when a second victim was taken on January 8, 2007. The victim was 13-year-old Benjamin Ownby. After years of abuse, police were finally able to identify Michael's white pickup truck and made a formal arrest. On January 12, 2007, Sean and Benjamin were reunited with family members. Sean was able to tell investigators that he had been tied up to a futon in the apartment and had almost died after his kidnapper attempted to strangle him in a remote field. On October 8th, Michael Delvin pled guilty and was charged with kidnapping, armed criminal action, three counts of forcible sodomy, and one count of attempted forcible sodomy. He was sentenced to 1,850 years in prison with an additional 170 years added to his sentence for making pornography with one of the boys while in captivity. It seems quite bizarre when a kidnapper puts trust in their victim. Luckily, sometimes that trust betrays them. Natasha Kampusch was a 10-year-old girl living with her parents in Vienna, Austria. On March 2, 1998, authorities were notified of Natasha's disappearance after she was reported missing from school and had failed to return home. A 12-year-old student walking to school that morning had noticed Natasha being forced into a minivan by two men. Knowing that something wasn't right, the student reported it to police in hopes of helping the girl. Hundreds of police desperately searched for Natasha, going as far as examining 700 76 minivans for any possible clues in the investigation. For eight years, Natasha was held captive in a small cellar underneath a garage owned by her kidnapper, Wolfgang Pricklepill. The 54 square foot chamber was made soundproof with no windows, leaving Natasha left to sit in a cold and dark prison for years to come. By the time Natasha was 18, she was allowed to be outside in the garden and upstairs, but was forced to sleep each night in the chamber. Wolfgang eventually allowed Natasha to go outside with him, however he had threatened to kill her if she cried for help while out in public. Natasha was only allowed to stay upstairs in order to clean and cook for Wolfgang, and had been privileged to read books, watch taped programs on a television, and she also had been given a radio that allowed her to listen to foreign radio stations so she would be unaware of the missing search for her in Austria. Though it seemed like times weren't so bad, Wolfgang severely abused Natasha, chaining her up and beating her up to 200 times per week. Aside from this, Natasha would often be intentionally starved and raped on a number of occasions. On August 23rd, 2006, Natasha was able to successfully escape her captivity while vacuuming Wolfgang's van. While cleaning, Wolfgang received a phone call and had no choice but to take the call in another room due to the loud noise of the vacuum outside. Seeing a possible opportunity to escape, Natasha left the vacuum on and ran off the property, running approximately 200 meters until alerting a 71-year-old woman to call the police. Police were able to arrive at the house at 1.04 p.m. that afternoon and successfully confirmed Natasha's identity by a prominent scar and DNA testing. Once discovering that Natasha fled, Wolfgang himself fled the property in order to escape police. Coming to terms that he was destined to be apprehended for his merciless actions, Wolfgang committed suicide by jumping in front of a train before police could catch him. Since her escape, Natasha has written a book on her ordeal and now owns the house that she was held captive in all those years ago. 
a terrible arrangement made by equally terrible people. Elizabeth was a 14-year-old teenager that lived with her large family in Salt Lake City, Utah. On June 4, 2002, the family attended an award ceremony at Bryant Middle School. With six children in the house, their father, Ed, made sure to lock up the house in the evening for protection, but avoided turning on the house alarm in case one of the children got up in the middle of the night. Both Elizabeth and her nine-year-old sister, Mary, shared a room together. At approximately 2 a.m. the following the following morning, Brian David Mitchell entered the girl's room, making his way in quietly through the window. Mary pretended to be asleep while Brian abducted Elizabeth from her bed in hopes of getting a good description of the man. She described the kidnapper as a 5'8 white man in his 30s to 40s that had threatened Elizabeth with a knife. Mary could hear the two walking out of the bedroom and within minutes she hopped out of her bed and was about to alert her parents until she realized that the kidnapper and Elizabeth were in the hallway looking into her brother's bed. Bedroom. Fearing for her life, Mary lied perfectly still in bed for nearly two hours until she felt safe enough to walk to her parents' bedroom. A massive search was initiated with just over 2,000 volunteers a day searching for Elizabeth in the community. Fearful of Elizabeth's whereabouts, Elizabeth's parents were persistent in attempting to locate their daughter. However, after many days dedicated to searching, volunteers closed their search in hopes of investigators finding the abducted teen. By October 2002, Mary was able to give officers a break when she identified the voice of a man by the name of Emmanuel. Brian Mitchell often called himself Emmanuel, and because of Mary's breakthrough in the case, the family was able to have a sketch artist draw Brian Mitchell. Elizabeth's case became so big in the media that the sketch was released by John Walsh while making an appearance on Larry King Live. On March 12, 2003, Brian was spotted out in public with his wife, Wanda, and Elizabeth by a biker who had recognized Brian's face on America's Most Wanted. Elizabeth had been dressed in disguise wearing a gray wig with sunglasses and a veil. Police were able to bring Brian and his wife in for questioning, allowing Elizabeth to finally reunite with the family. Elizabeth was able to testify on October 1st, 2009 that her abductor had placed his hand over her chest and a knife to her throat, threatening to kill her and her entire family if she didn't listen to him. Elizabeth was then taken to Brian's camp deep in the woods, where his wife Wanda would wash Elizabeth, change her into a robe, and perform a marriage ceremony with Brian, where he would would rape her. The following months into Elizabeth's captivity, Brian repeatedly raped her and forced her to drink alcohol and watch pornographic films against her will. On December 11, 2010, Brian Mitchell was found guilty of kidnapping and transporting a minor across state lines with intent to engage in sexual activity. He was eventually sentenced to two life terms in prison without the possibility of parole and is now serving his time at the United States Penitentiary in Tucson, Arizona. Elizabeth is now an activist championing for causes to prevent other children from becoming lost or abducted. Greed can inspire jealousy, and jealousy can bring about your downfall. Colleen Stan was 20 years old and confident in hitchhiking the places she needed to go. On May 19, 1977, Colleen was invited to a friend's birthday party. Unable to get a ride from friends, she decided to do what she knew best and hitchhiked her way to the party. After allowing two vehicles to pass her, Colleen waved down a car that she knew she could trust. The driver was Cameron Hooker. Sitting in the passenger seat was his wife Janice and their baby. Colleen climbed into the family's blue van and off they went. Things had appeared to be just fine until Cameron drove into an isolated area and put a knife to Colleen's throat. Now in their possession, the kidnappers placed Colleen in a wooden box that restricted light, sound, and fresh air from entering. Colleen was kept inside of the wooden box for up to 23 hours every day until she was forced to sign herself off as a slave to the family for life during the following year in 1978. Cameron and his wife identified Colleen as Kay and had instructed her to call Cameron her master while held in captivity. Cameron would later go on to tell Colleen that a powerful organization called The Company would torture her and her family if she ever tried to escape her new home. For seven years, Colleen was used as a sex slave and would often take care of Cameron and Janice's children. Cameron eventually gave Colleen permission to work in the yard and go as far as to visit her family accompanied by him. 
Colleen's family questioned her lifestyle and assumed that she might have joined a cult due to her homemade clothing and lack of money. Cameron introduced himself as Colleen's boyfriend and even had his picture taken with Colleen, both of them appearing happy and content with one another. By 1984, Cameron wanted Colleen to be his second wife, causing Janice to hate the twisted family circumstances. Things came to a breaking point for Janice after Cameron began talking about kidnapping an additional four females to become his slaves. Unable to take the relationship any longer, Janice realized that she had been brainwashed by her husband and decided to leave him, ultimately moving back to her hometown. After months of seeing whether or not her husband would change, Janice called police and alerted them of Colleen's abduction. Colleen was brought back to her family in 1984 and Janice testified against her husband during his trial in 1985 for full immunity. Cameron Hooker was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and using a knife in the process, totaling 104 years in prison. Cameron attempted to request for parole on April 16, 2015, but was denied and will be eligible for a second hearing in 2030. Both Colleen and Janice reside in California with changed last names. Some victims become so brainwashed over time that they begin to desire their captivity. It was September 1990 when J.C. Dugard and her family moved to South Lake Tahoe in hopes of living in a peaceful and safe community. On the morning of June 10, 1991, 11-year-old J.C. walked on her own to catch the school bus when she was approached by a man driving what appeared to be a gray sedan. J.C. initially believed that the driver was looking for directions. However, before anything could be said, the man rolled down his window and hit J.C. with a stun gun, knocking her unconscious. The driver was Philip Garrido who was accompanied by his wife, Nancy. Once placing JC into the vehicle, Nancy helped keep JC down as she drifted in and out of consciousness. Classmates as well as JC's stepfather, Carl Proben, witnessed the kidnapping. Carl immediately got on a bike and attempted to track down the car, but was unable to catch up. It would be the last time Carl would see his stepdaughter for 18 years. A large amount of posters were put up around the city as thousands did what they could to search for the missing child. The amount of attention on JC's missing case resulted in nationwide attention and was featured on an episode of America's Most Wanted on June 14, 1991. While in captivity by Philip and Nancy, JC had been temporarily kept in a tiny shed that had been bolted shut. Philip tried to scare JC by informing her that he had large Doberman pinchers patrolling her and would be ready to attack if she dared escape the private property. Philip eventually moved JC into a room where she would be handcuffed to a bedpost. Philip repeatedly raped the 11-year-old, telling her that demon angels let him kidnap her to help him with his sexual problems. Philip began abusing methamphetamine in front of JC and would often cry and apologize for capturing her, but would then suddenly change his tone and later threatened to sell JC if she didn't cooperate. After numerous rapes, JC became pregnant when she was 13 and gave birth to her first daughter on August 18, 1994. A second daughter was born on November 13, 1997. Philip attempted to corrupt JC and her daughter's minds by instructing JC to call Nancy her mother, and once the daughters were old enough to understand, JC would teach them that she was their older sister. As as the years passed, the children grew accustomed to their life and were homeschooled by JC. Suspicion eventually grew in the neighborhood when Philip's neighbor, Patrick McQuaid, saw JC through his fence. Upon introducing himself, JC stated her name, and when asked if she was visiting the Garrido residence, JC told the neighbor that she lived on the property. Philip noticed the interaction and intervened by pulling her back into the home, soon building an eight-foot-tall fence, keeping everyone away from the property. Philip eventually set up a print shop where he had JC working as a designer. Despite her access to phone and email, JC never attempted to seek help from law enforcement while in captivity. On August 24, 2009, Philip visited the San Francisco FBI office, leaving a bizarre four-page document on how to cure sexual predators through religion. 
Philip then took JC's two daughters to the University of California where he asked if he could hold an event based on his religious beliefs. Many saw Philip's behavior as odd and erratic. Police on campus were able to contact Officer Allie Jacobs to do a background check on Philip, and she was able to discover that he was a very troubled man and was a registered sex offender on federal parole for kidnapping and rape. Officer Jacobs became incredibly worried and suspicious of the situation regarding the two children with Philip and decided to get a hold of parole officers, relaying her concern. On August 26, 2009, Philip was escorted to the parole office in Concord, California with his wife Nancy, JC, and her two daughters. While in public, JC was forced to identify herself as Alyssa, and when questioned by investigators, JC became agitated and stated that although Philip was a sex offender, he was a changed man, defending her kidnapper at all costs. Parole officers eventually called the Concord police, which ultimately led Philip to confessing the 1991 kidnapping and rape of J.C. Dugard. After his formal confession, J.C. was able to reveal her true identity, allowing her to be freed from her 18 years in captivity. Philip and Nancy Garrido were placed under arrest, giving J.C. and her daughters the chance to reunite with the Dugard family. On April 28, 2011, the Garridos pled guilty to kidnapping and rape, and on June 2, 2011, Nancy Garrido Garrido was sentenced to 36 years to life. She is currently incarcerated and serving her time at a Central California women's facility. Philip Garrido was sentenced to 431 years in prison. A severely mentally unstable man did his best to hide a terribly dark secret. Fusako Seno was a nine-year-old student in Sanjo, Japan when she disappeared on November 13, 1990. Fusako was invited to join her two schoolmates in watching an after-school game of baseball. After enjoying a fun event with friends, Fusako walked back home alone when a man named Nobuyuki Sato approached her at knife point, forcing Fusako into the trunk of his car. Once arriving at his home, Nobu Yuki walked Fusako to his upstairs bedroom where he would keep her captive for nearly a decade. Her kidnapper was mentally unstable and had admitted to kidnapping her in order to have a companion he could talk to. Nobuyuki restricted his mother from entering his bedroom. During her months held in captivity, Fusako was tied up and her mouth was taped, disabling her from calling for help. Nobuyuki would order Fusako to videotape horse races on television if she refused to listen to him or if she messed up. He would punish her by punching threatening her with a knife or using a stun gun on her. If at any point Fusako dared try to escape his bedroom, Nobuyuki threatened to abandon Fusako alone in the mountains and leave her fearing for her life. Nobuyuki's abnormal mental state often worried his mother. Whenever she was close to his bedroom, he would erratically act out in violence and yell at her to stay away. Concerned for her own safety, Nobuyuki's mother contacted social workers at the Niigata Health Center for guidance. After many calls, police were sent to the house to assess Nobuyuki. While in the house, Fusako was able to approach officers where she said, I was abducted near the school by a man who forced me into a car. For nine years, I did not take a step out of the house. Today, I went for the first time. Police were easily able to indicate that the abducted woman was severely dehydrated and had been suffering from jaundice. Because Fusako had not seen sunlight in nine years, her skin was very pale. Nobuyuki was immediately hospitalized on January 28, 2000 and was eventually arrested for the kidnapping. Nobuyuki was officially sentenced to 14 years in prison on July 10, 2003. Fusako now deals with post-traumatic stress disorder and attempts to regain her life. Though she was just 19 at the time of her discovery, Fusako still had the mind of a nine-year-old child, resulting in very slow development. Fusako continues to live her life day by day, adjusting to a normal lifestyle. A disgusting man motivated by cowardice and hatred, one who would inflict pain at the drop of a hat but was very much unable to take any pain for himself. Ariel Castro moved to 2207 Seymour Avenue with his wife, Grimilda, in 1992. According to relatives, all hell started breaking loose when the couple moved into their home. Ariel frequently beat his wife, breaking bones, throwing her downstairs, and cracking her skull. He was a violent man that took his aggression out while inside the house. After his wife moved out and took custody of their four children in 1996, Ariel was left alone. Unable to handle the solitude, Ariel found alternative 
alternative and illegal ways to keep company, Ariel targeted his first victim on August 23, 2002. Michelle Knight was 21 years old at the time of her abduction and had been leaving a cousin's house when Ariel pulled to the side of the road and offered her a ride. Michelle had previously been acquainted with one of Ariel's daughters, and because of this she gladly accepted the ride. Michelle was a young mother that had lost custody of her little boy during this time. In order to persuade Michelle to go into his house, Ariel told Michelle that he had a puppy he wanted to give to her son. Once entering his home, Ariel restrained Michelle, placing her in an upstairs bedroom that would end up being a place of torture and despair for years to come. His second victim was 16-year-old Amanda Berry, who disappeared the following year on April 21, 2003. Amanda's family had last heard from her when she called her sister to inform her that she would be getting a ride back home from her job at Burger King. Amanda failed to make it home that evening. The FBI originally believed that the teen was a typical runaway. However, this theory would change after Amanda's mother received a call from her daughter's cell phone. When answering, an unidentified man spoke to Amanda's mother saying, I have Amanda. She's fine and will be coming home in a couple of days. Ariel's third and final victim was 14-year-old Gina De Jesus, who was last seen at a payphone on April 2, 2004. Gina was a close friend of Ariel's daughter, Arlene. The two girls asked Romilda if they could have a sleepover. Once told they could not spend the night at Arlene's house, both girls parted ways. This would be the last time anyone saw Gina before her abduction. No witnesses had come forward, but despite this, she was featured on an episode of America's Most Wanted, along with an FBI composite sketch who had similar features to Ariel Castro. All three victims were tied with chains in dark rooms and had been raped multiple times by Ariel. Each of the girls were forced to use a plastic toilet that was infrequently emptied, would shower twice a week at most, and were each fed one small meal per day. Despite all three victims being severely abused and treated like animals, Ariel favorited Amanda after impregnating her and forcing Michelle to assist in the birth of the child in 2006. If the baby did not live, Ariel threatened to kill Michelle. After birthing Amanda's child in an old inflatable swimming pool, the baby initially failed to breathe. However, Michelle was able to resuscitate the newborn. During their time in captivity, Michelle was forced to have five abortions. Once Ariel discovered her pregnancy, he starved and beat her, hitting her with dumbbells and slamming her against walls. Gina had also been frequently raped, but was reported to not have been impregnated by Ariel during her time in captivity. On one occasion, Ariel had given Michelle a pet dog, but her time bonding with the companion didn't last long after the dog attacked Ariel when he attempted to beat Michelle. Enraged that the dog was defending Michelle, Ariel grabbed the dog and snapped its neck. Ariel frequently took Amanda's baby out in public to his mother's house where he introduced the child as his girlfriend's daughter. Whenever Ariel's son Anthony visited the home, he reported that there were no places to go as his father had securely locked down most areas of the house. Neighbors began to grow suspicious and observe the property. Seeming to live on his own, many found it strange that he would gate the entire house and board up the windows. On May 6, 2013, Amanda and her six-year-old daughter were able to successfully escape the house after Ariel had failed to lock a main door inside of the house. Amanda was able to scream for help and catch the attention of neighbors. Neighbors were able to kick a hole through the bottom of the storm door where Amanda and her daughter were let out. Free at last, Amanda ran to a house and in desperation called police saying, help me, I'm Amanda Berry, I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm here, I'm free now. Responding officers were able to free Gina De Jesus and Michelle Knight from captivity. Together, the three women and child were taken to Metro Health Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Ariel was arrested the same day and was charged on May 8th with four counts of kidnapping and three counts of rape. On July 26, 2013, Ariel pled guilty to hundreds of kidnapping rape and aggravated murder charges. Afterward, Ariel would go on to say that he never beat or tortured the women, saying that most of the sex he had with all three was consensual. Ariel would go on to apologize to his victims, saying, I hope they can find it in their hearts to forgive me, because we had a lot of harmony going on in that home. On August 1st, 2013, Ariel Castro was sentenced to life in prison with an additional 1,000 years, all without a chance 
for parole. All three women were able to publicly speak about their torturous captivity being interviewed by many news outlets. On August 7, 2013, the Castro home was demolished as part of Ariel's plea bargain. Ariel had been serving his time in the Pickaway Correctional Institution when he was found dead, hanging from a tied bedsheet in his cell. It had only been a month into his time in prison when he committed suicide. That's all for this episode. I'd like you to know that I've started a new series. My new series is called Question Everything, and it covers all of the bizarre and sometimes eerie questions you've always wondered about. I've released three episodes so far. The first investigates the possible benefits to eating human meat and what it tastes like. The second episode explores what would happen if your brain was put into another body. And the most recent episode covers the possible truth concerning extraterrestrial life and where aliens might be located. This series is sure to feed your darkest curiosities, so be sure to head down into the description below for links to all three episodes. There is a new episode every Friday, so be sure to tune in and expand the darkest recesses of your mind. Thank you for watching. Also, you can check the description below for links to resources on how to keep your children safe from situations such as these. And of course, if you'd like to learn more dark and disturbing topics, please be sure to subscribe to my channel now, and I will see you next Wednesday.